Good morning. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to those in the sanctuary and those worshiping online as well. I know usually during the children's message, we have the kids turn around and wave at the cameras. Uh, we heard from someone who worships online with us who said they would like for the congregation to turn around and wave to them. So let's wave to our, our worshipers online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. Christy is away today, so thank you for Dan for stepping up with some accompaniment, and to Mary Weaver also for helping to lead us in music this morning. We're so thankful for you. A few announcements. This afternoon is our part three, our final part of our book study, Surprised by Hope. We meet at four o'clock in the library. You don't have to have come to the other two sessions to come this afternoon, but four o'clock, good book discussion in the library. Next Sunday, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper in worship, and then in the afternoon is the all-church pool party from 5 to 7 at Melvin Ford Aquatic Center. So come out. We have the place to ourselves. Come out and enjoy popsicles and swimming and time with each other next Sunday the 4th. The Sunday after that, August 11th, can you believe that's almost here, two weeks away, on August 11th in worship, we will have Blessing of the Backpacks, which we do every year right before school gets started, not just for kids. If you want to bring a briefcase, a backpack, a purse, diaper bag, um, as well as backpacks for school, and bring them up and put them around the chancel during worship, we will have the Blessing of the Backpacks. And then that evening on August 11th, we get the Amazium all to ourselves for our congregation from 6 to 8 on the 11th, just for us or anybody you want to invite. You can bring family, neighbors, friends. Just let us know ahead of time so that we can give a head count to the Amazium for our special night for our congregation on the 11th. Our newsletter for August will be out soon, so check that for more announcements. Lots going on. Um, but I do want to call your attention to the last page of your bulletin. It should look like this. We've been talking about that this summer opportunities to be part of the Sunday morning worship team. We always refresh those teams going into the fall, so if you feel interested and called to being an usher, a greeter, helping with the AV Tech team, they always do such a great job, thank you all back there, um, or music, any of the things on the list here, just check those off and put them in the, in the offering plate or leave them with the office. There's also a QR code there that you can go and sign up that way. So we hope to put together some refreshed teams for the fall, and thank you for your willingness to serve. Well, God has gathered us in worship. Let's prepare our hearts. Will you pray with me, please? Everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, this morning we join with all who praise your name, giving you honor and glory. We are grateful that you have drawn us together to receive your word, to sing with joy, and to be in fellowship with others. Where we have been weak, grant us your strength. Where we have been distraught, grant us your comfort. Fill us with your spirit and enliven our souls. We offer all praise and glory to you, almighty God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For our introit, um, Dan and Mary will sing this through one time and then we'll join them on the second time through.
You are invited to stand in body or spirit and join responsively in the call to worship. Our help is from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. We rejoice in God's love and faithfulness. Ascribe to God glory and power. Worship God in awe and reverence. Holy is our God. The whole earth is full of God's glory. In the Lord's congregation, we all sing glory. Thanks be to Almighty God for all that is good. Amen. You may be seated. We lift our alleluias and our amens to the Lord. And at the same time, as human beings, we acknowledge that our lives do not always align with our praise. Scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet with that acknowledgement, we also affirm that we are made right with God, forgiven by God, by the gift of God's grace, through the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus. So trusting in God's mercy and grace, let us confess our sin first together and then silently. Let us pray together. God of glory, we confess that our lives have not glorified you. God of light, we create shadows that keep others from seeing you. God of goodness, we have not embodied evil for this world. We ask your forgiveness. Restore us to be the salt of the earth. Shine through us again. Give us a spirit of gratitude and joy. Help us recommit to the ways of Jesus, in whose name we offer our prayer. Amen. Great is God's steadfast love toward us, delivering our souls from the depths and restoring us to life. Let us give thanks with our whole hearts, rejoicing in this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's stand.
May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's take a moment to greet one another with Christ's grace and peace. Good morning, children and everyone else. It's nice to be up here today. I enjoy the occasional quarterly sermon opportunity, and um, today is that day. I want to start out as we're thinking about what we're going to hear in our scriptures and what we've been singing about and talking about in our liturgy. The first thing I want you guys to do, and I need your help. I'm glad you're a little bit older because this is going to be a little bit of a lesson in physics, or at least related to that. When you look around this room, and there's not necessarily one entirely correct answer to this question, but when you look around this room, what is it that enables us to see the things around us and that enables us to point them out? I heard from you, Fletcher, say what you said. Our eyes, they're an important part of it. We have to have photo reception, very good. And then what did you say? The light. The light is the thing that, despite the fact that we have eyes, what are, what, are, what, what, can our eye, what are our eyes capable of without the light? Nothing. If it was dark in here, we wouldn't be able to see anything. But when we look around today, we can point out features. I see the clock. I see the baptismal. Um, of course, we see the glass that the light is streaming through. Now, what is the source of all the light that enables us to see the things in here? electricity, the light bulbs, and the sun. And would you agree with me if I said technically the sun is what enables all of those other things, like the electricity and the light bulb? The sun is the comprehensive source of all of the energy that we here on planet Earth um, take advantage of. I suppose we don't do it personally, but we're able to um, transform that energy into other things, like, for example, artificial lights. So in this case, I've got a little headlamp here, and there's a battery pack here. Um, and believe it or not, if the sun didn't exist, this thing wouldn't be able to exist either. And this does become a source of light, I can show you. It's quite bright, so I'm going to try not to shine it right into your eyeballs. But you see how that light, and we can even illuminate different things with this light. We can highlight things by pointing it toward it, so on and so forth. Um, but Ultimately, the reason that we're able to see everything around us um, is because of the sun. Now, I want to show you a couple of things that you can do with light. And these won't be entirely foreign to you. What I have here is what? Right. And so what does this enable me to do with the light? I'm doing a little bit of a... I've got two hands and a mic, and it doesn't work so well. Yeah, so if I were to use that mirror, I can redirect that light in other directions. Now, what good is this mirror without the light? 
Right, but then if you had no light on your face in order to see the reflection, what good is it? <laughs> I'm looking like a Halloween character here. Um, so yeah, the the, uh, the the mirror also requires the light, and what it does is it's able to bounce the light. The light reflects off of it, and things that are not directly uh, exposed to the light can be illuminated by it. And then I have another uh, material here. Anybody know what that is? Can you recognize this? Check this material out. The, uh, the normal way that this stuff works is you have to like get in your dark closet with your parents or something like that. But in the case of this particular material, it's super glow in the dark. So it's really, really strong. And you can, even in the, even in the bright daylight, you can see that it's absorbed some of that light and it's emitting some of that light. Now in our scriptures today, in the first one, we're gonna hear the psalmist say that um, my heart glorifies the Lord. Um, when we say our heart glorifies the Lord, w like what does your heart normally do? Pump blood, correct. Um, so think that that's kind of a metaphor maybe for glorifying it. So what, what does it mean when our heart glorifies God? Well, it's kind of it's kind of like an internal process, right? God's light shines in our hearts, and our hearts retain that glow. Our hearts retain some of that um, some of that brilliance that came um, from the light. Um, in the uh, New Testament reading, the people who saw Jesus do what Jesus did in healing the paralytic man said. They praise God with their mouths, and they said they do it because of what they have seen. They saw something that Jesus did, and what it did was it came out of their mouths. Do you think it also in, in affected their hearts? Yeah, but it also came out of the mouth. So those are just a two couple simple ways. Do you have a question? A glow-in-the-dark mirror. There's some similarity there. It retains some of it. Um, so keep that in mind that there are a couple many ways in which we reflect the light of God and we refer to that as glorifying God. Some of those ways are that we absorb God's love and God's goodness and we, uh, we emanate it. it. It glows from within. And then in some of those ways, we use our mouths and we redirect it toward others and in the presence of others. Okay? Let's pray here real quick. Lord, thanks for... Um, the goodness that you fill this world with in every way. We pray that we would recognize that, that we would be, that we would glow with that goodness within ourselves and that we would say what it is that we see when we notice your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. You may go back to your parents and your pews. Thank you. Let us pray for the illumination of God's word. Eternal God, speak to us now as we wait for a word from you. Let your wisdom guide our steps. Let your hope restore our lives. Let your joy fill our days. Establish us as your people, strong and sure on our journey, and inspire us for works of love. In thanks and praise, we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. Listen for the word of the Lord. One day while Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Just then, some men came, carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. 
They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, Who is this who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Stand up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up and take your bed and go to your home. Immediately he stood up before them, took what had been, he had been lying on, and went to his home, glorifying God. Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen strange things today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God. The healed man immediately stood up before the crowd and went home glorifying God. What did that look like? Was he dancing with his newly functioning legs? Was he singing? Glory to God, glory to God, alleluia. Was he waving his arms in joy? Was he glorifying God by telling along the way, telling anyone who would listen what Jesus and the man's brave creative friends had just done for him? Maybe he glorified God by simply saying, and I don't know the Greek word for this, but maybe he glorified God by simply saying, wow, and then there was the crowd who witnessed this unexpected turn of events. Our scripture says, amazement seized all of them and they glorified God and were filled with awe. And then it adds that they said, we have seen strange things today. What shape did that glorifying take? Emerging from the crowd of witnesses, were they chattering excitedly about it? Were they giving credit to God for what had just happened? Maybe as a group also singing? Glory to God. Glory to God. Alleluia. And I'm sure that there were more than a few stunned utterances of wow. Some of you have read Anne Lamott's book about prayer, descriptively named Help, Thanks, Wow. In that book, she distills many of the prayers that we utter into those three groupings, help, thanks, and wow. And those categories aren't all inclusive, but they do cover a lot of ground prayer-wise. Not that we're mirroring Lamott's pattern exactly, but already this summer in our preaching series on prayers in scripture, we've certainly lifted up words for prayer that are asking for help. From the Gospel of Mark, I believe, Help my unbelief. From Isaac's servant in Genesis, O oh Lord, let something good happen today. From Psalm 18, help me in my distress. From Proverbs, help me to be wise. And actually next week, we'll be looking at giving thanks. But today is about wow, about glorifying God. Listen as God's word continues for us this morning from Psalm 86. 
I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will glorify your name forever. Those of you who are cradle Presbyterians, you might recall memorizing the opening question and answer from the Westminster Catechism. The question is, what is the chief end of man? Anybody? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. So, of course, we can get a good start on that by praying the words of Psalm 86. O oh Lord, my God, with my whole heart, I will glorify your name forever, for great is your steadfast love toward me. Wonderful words for prayer. But what leads us to say it and mean it with our whole heart, rather than just saying it because we know we should? What is it about God that makes us genuinely, enthusiastically, almost involuntarily proclaim, wow. Well, here's another audience participation question. How many of you, show of hands if you're willing, how many of you have made it to Crystal Bridges in the last several months to take in the special exhibit called Exquisite Creatures? Wow, now I'm saying, wow, that's a lot of us. Yeah, some of you I know have gone more than once and taken friends and relatives. Pretty awesome, huh? For those of you who haven't seen it, you've got one more day. <laughs> it closes tomorrow. So we're going to look at some of the pictures here from, from that exhibit. Those are real butterflies arranged in that frame. Christopher Marley is an artist and a naturalist. The description of his work is that he uses preserved natural specimens as his medium. So before we go any further, it's important to note that Marley didn't just go out hunting and catching and killing his creatures for his projects. All of the vertebrates in his artwork are reclaimed after their natural deaths. And as far as the insects, and I'm just going to read this from the website, it says, he also utilizes insects that are collected or bred in an environmentally sensitive manner using a worldwide network of people and institutions that share his passion for nature. Tom and I went to the exhibit last week, and we kept having to remind ourselves that none of the creatures or shells and so forth, none of those were painted or embellished. These are... God's color choices, God's intentional vibrancy on display. And we sure heard a lot of wows as we worked our way through the dozens and dozens of displays by Christopher Marley. We uttered some of those wows ourselves, of course. And because it is late July, there were gobs of children there with parents, grandparents, and day camp leaders, and it was heartwarming and inspiring to hear the wows coming from them, too, at displays like this next one. Now, whatever that is, <laughs> it's about eight or ten inches long. It's, it's huge, and it was the description didn't give a scientific name for it, but wow. A little more about Christopher Marley. This is again from the website. It says, his passion for discovering unfamiliar elements in the natural world became an obsession. His work was born of a desire to share nature's majesty in a way that both inspires both the urbane and the nature aficionado equally. Marley believes that in the proper light, beauty is found in every organism and that the deeper our appreciation for the aesthetics of nature, the more eager we are to immerse ourselves in it and conserve it. 
throughout the exhibit hall, for me, there was this double wow effect, and I imagine for most others as well. There is the awe at seeing up close the extravagant details that God lavishly bestows on all these creatures, almost a wasteful doling out of color and brightness and pattern and diversity. If you've ever thought a bug was just a bug or a fish was just a fish, then that kind of shallow thinking is banished forever in the midst of this beauty. The second point of amazement, of course, is the talent of the human artist, Christopher Marley, in seeking out, in gathering, arranging, and illuminating these creatures such that what we see, we may never otherwise see it. He brings it close to us. He lights it up for us. For instance, look at this grouping of rays, freshwater rays, the black and the white and the way he positioned them. I just thought rays were rays, but these have such artistry to them, and we can see that in his arrangement. My photography is not that great. It's so much better in person, of course, but I'll show you a few more of his pieces that bring out color and pattern through this artistry, and by artistry, I mean God's artistry combined with Marley's. Go back one, there, there we go. Okay, seashells, of course, color and pattern and even strangeness. And when you collect seashells, you might see some of that, but he puts them together in that really interesting way. And then this guy, uh, looks like he's kind of looking at you when you look at him. This is called an orange lobster. And then there's this next thing. Look real close. That is called a leafy sea dragon. It's a, it's a creature, it's not a plant. But of course it looks like one, so it's called a leafy sea dragon. I heard the children nearby murmuring, wow, at this and others. And I hear the crowd in Luke's gospel from today's reading breathlessly saying, we have seen strange things today. And then I just had to throw in this chameleon. Again, not painted or embellished. That's truly what that chameleon looks like in nature, in all of its God-given brilliance and playfulness. There were lots of other chameleons displayed in that particular large frame, but this one was my favorite. And then, growing up on the Oregon coast, I was especially thrilled to see this arrangement of sea urchins. There we go. Christopher Marley was raised in Oregon, and he lives there now and has a huge studio in Salem, Oregon. But we always saw sea urchins growing up in the tide pools of the Pacific coast. Never quite arranged that beautifully yet, but still beautiful nonetheless. A few months ago in our worship service, we marveled and gazed upon the up-close photos of insects in the wild taken by the entomologist Donald Steinkraus. You might remember that. That's akin to this, except the actual objects in the wild, in this case, are collected and brought near, and the element of artistry is added to it as Marley uses animals, vegetable, and minerals in his composition. And of course, Marley hopes that we'll be inspired to get out into the wild more often and more deeply to experience some of this gorgeousness in its habitat. Bishop N.T. Wright, who wrote the book that we'll be discussing this afternoon, Surprised by Hope, in that book, he writes about the beauty of creation and what humans can do alongside that beauty. And he says this, he says, to make sense of and celebrate a beautiful world through the production of artifacts that are themselves beautiful is part of the call to be stewards of creation. He says, genuine art is thus itself a response to the beauty of creation, which itself is a pointer to the beauty of God. N.T. Wright, in, in writing that, he's specifically thinking of painters, but his comment would equally apply to the works of exquisite creatures in that exhibit by Christopher Marley. Not that Wright and Marley have been in conversation with each other, I suspect not, I don't know how Christopher Marley would describe his faith or how it influences his, his art, but what a fitting and helpful description 
N.T. Wright has as it applies to art generally. Genuine art is thus itself a response to the beauty of creation, which itself is a pointer to the beauty of God. Let's gaze upon one more of Marley's geometric compositions. This is one of beetles. It reminds me so much of a stained glass window, but it's actually made entirely of beetles. I'm reminded of another psalm, Psalm 29, about the voice of the Lord over the mighty waters of the Mediterranean Sea and the power of nature leading to the awestruck response that says, and all in his temple say glory. It's as if all that is witnessed and experienced is so powerful that well-formed sentences of prose elude them and they say glory. And we say Wow. And I am moved once again by the partnership of the divine artist and the human artist. Not that it is an equal partnership, but on some level there is this element of working together to bring about a new expression of beauty. And it is an expression that spreads, inspiring appreciation and awe in others. This very thing happened in the gospel story from Luke that Hunter read for us this morning, a partnership. Jesus did a most awesome thing, well, two awesome things really, forgiveness of sins, awesome, and the healing of the man who was paralyzed, super awesome, but the man's creative friends were partners in that awesomeness. They climbed up the stairs outside the house, sweating and strategizing with each other as they hefted their friend upward, and on that flat roof, they moved aside the, the garden furniture, and they dug through the tiles and whatever else the roof was made of, encouraging and coordinating with each other as they lowered their friend through the roof in that opening, right into the room, right at Jesus' feet. Bits of clay and dust raining down on the gathered crowd below. They did their incredible thing, and God did God's really incredible thing, and the effect was that everyone else was seized with amazement, and they glorified God and were filled with awe. And perhaps the crowd danced and sang, and certainly they told others about what had happened. You know, it's not just nature that points us to the majesty of God, that stirs appreciation and gratitude, in us, it's acts of kindness and sacrifice and heroism. It's unexplained and unexpected goodness. It's hope bursting in where all felt hopeless. It's a community coming together by the power of the Holy Spirit to soothe and envision and recreate. It's hundreds of people dancing together on a riverbank in France. Did you see that Friday night, the Olympics? It's athletic magnificence and patient teamwork. It is color and light and joy. In Anne Lamott's book on prayer, in the section of wow prayers, she says that there are lowercase wows and uppercase wows. She says the lowercase wows, she writes this, are things like slipping into clean, fresh, cool sheets after a long, rough day. While the uppercase wows might be Yosemite or fireworks or learning that a brontosaurus was 75 feet long. Wow. The lowercase wows are frequent and important, but I would say that the exquisite creatures exhibit is an uppercase wow. And the story in Luke of the man who was paralyzed and his friends his, who helped him might even be an all caps wow. And most profound of all, more impactful than all of this, is the realization that we are deeply loved by God and that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Glory. Wow. 
So I have two questions for us to take home today. When or where might we notice, might we be led to say glory, to say wow? Let's open our eyes, let's notice and appreciate and celebrate, let's praise God for those things, large and small. And then the second question, how do we come alongside God's majesty, majesty, artistry, and goodness? How do we come alongside God's steadfast love and then work with it, add to it, working together with God to bring about new expressions of beauty, goodness, and love? The word glorify in Hebrew, as it's used in Psalm 86, it means to recognize the gravity of something, to ascribe the proper weight to it. O oh Lord my God, I will glorify your name forever. The very word glorify is a prayer, and much more than a prayer. It propels us, it compels us to take God's majesty and intention seriously and to therefore be changed and engaged. So where is the magnificence and how can we engage? Wow, glory, may it be so and may we be a part of it. Amen. I'm gonna invite Dan and Mary to come and lead us in singing. Now we have a chance to create our own wow moment. Isn't that a great thing? Wow indeed. So uh, this is uh, another opportunity to uh, make music together as a congregation. And there is a wonderful, wonderful thing when it comprises just our own voices, right? No accompaniment, no organ, no piano, no flute, nothing like that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to sing Glory to God. Mary's going to assist with that. We're going to just sing it again together, but we'll do it two times through. And, oh my goodness, there's no piano or organ. Can we stand and do that? Let's stand. And glory to God, glory to God, glory in the highest, glory to God. Glory to God, Alleluia, Alleluia. Glory to God, glory to God, glory in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, Alleluia, Alleluia. It's a wonderful thing to hear our voices, isn't it? It is a wonderful thing. Would you join me now in the affirmation of faith? We sing of God the Spirit, who from the beginning has swept over the face of creation, animating all energy and matter and moving into the human heart. We sing of God the Spirit, faithful and untamable, who is creatively and redemptively active in the world. We sing of God the Spirit, who speaks our prayers of deepest longing and enfolds our concerns and confessions, transforming us and the world. We offer worship as an outpouring of gratitude and awe and a practice of opening ourselves to God's will, a small voice of comfort, to God's rushing whirlwind of challenge through word, music, art, and sacrament in community and in solitude God changes our lives, our relationships, and our world. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, you formed us from the dust of the earth, and by your breath you give us life. You have infused all of your creation with beauty, wonder, and awe. You call us to the joyful and generous sharing of your loving care with all living things and one another. And so we praise you, we glorify you, and we lift our prayers to you, O Lord. Like the friends in our scripture did today, we carry our neighbors, our friends, our whole human family down through the roof and to your feet, seeking healing and forgiveness. Lord, so many carry heavy burdens, burdens of worry and weariness, of health concerns, of addiction, burdens of loneliness, of difficult relationships, burdens of overwork or lack of work, the ongoing storm recovery and the stress that goes with it. Lord, in all of these things, we lift up our prayers and we seek your comfort, your provision, your help, your wow. We pray for all who are on our prayer list and all whom we carry in our hearts. Lord, we pray for your power and your grace to come alongside all of us who are in need, that we may be uplifted in your hope, in your help, and in your love. Lord, so many need your peace. Peace in hearts, minds, and bodies. Peace in relationships. Peace in places of war where suffering and destruction and death are taking devastating tolls. God, bring your glory, your glory that heals and transforms, your glory that brings life, your glory that brings new creation. So, Lord, in our lives and in your church, in your world, Lord, be glorified today, even as we watch and work for your reign on earth as it is in heaven praying for your glory and your will in all things as we pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In all things, we live in response to God's glory and grace. We give in response to God's glory and grace, and we give as a way of participating in the wondrous things God is doing among us. Among us in our own lives, in our lives out in the community, and in and through the ministries of this congregation in so many ways. Care for those who are lonely, for those who are grieving or discouraged. Help for those who are hungry, for those who need help keeping the lights on and the water flowing in their homes. Community for those seeking to learn and to grow and to serve together. Thank you for your faithful giving. Every gift makes a difference. You may give today during the offering or any time online or by mail. God bless you as you give.
Let us pray. Lord, we praise you and glorify you. May these gifts be an act of our praise. And by your spirit, may they also be a catalyst, multiplying our ability to share your care and your compassion with our neighbors near and far, all for your sake and for your glory. Amen. We have come together and we have heard beautiful things, we have experienced together good things, and we have even seen some strange things, and now we go and tell. Now we go out from this place, go to our homes or wherever else we go, glorifying God, glorifying God with our prayers, with our words, and with our actions. So go out from here in peace and joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.